The next case to come before the court is Heather Cart, formerly known as Robin versus Bank of America National Association. Did I get those names correct? Okay. I believe so. Um, all right. Each party will have up to 15 minutes to present your arguments. The appellate may reserve up to five minutes to present uh, rebuttal. If you do plan to reserve time for rebuttal, please let me know as I'll be keeping track of the time. Uh, I'll try to alert you when you move into that rebuttal time. Uh, the arguments are being recorded, so please do stay behind the podium, introduce yourself, keep your voices up. Um, you should not use the names of children or minors or victims, should that be relevant during your argument. You can refer to both by their initials or generic terms. And we have read your briefs, and we're ready to proceed where you are. Um, and I would just ask Appellant, would you like to reserve time for a rebuttal? Yes, Your Honor, I would like to reserve three minutes, please. Very well, then you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. My name is Andy Engel. Um, I'm here on behalf of Appellant Heather Cart. Uh, today, we're looking at several issues relating to the nature of mortgages, uh, statute of limitations, the remedies available under them, and specifically in this case, Ms. Cart filed a motion or a, a complaint to quiet title uh, against an old mortgage, which admittedly was not paid in full, but uh, which had uh, is no, is time barred now and no longer enforceable uh, by the bank, at least in foreclosure. Um, the trial court below followed this court's decision in Hardesty versus Law Real Estate, and it, that decision I think was uh, was probably properly decided. I I don't like the sua sponte dismissal, but that's a, a side issue. Um, but in, that, in, in the Hardesty case, it, uh, the facts were significantly different. First, um, the plaintiff did not plead a specific basis for why the mortgage was invalid. The plaintiff merely pled in, it, in, in their complaint that there had been a forfeiture because uh, the bank had not prosecuted its foreclosure to termination and had not made any attempts to collect on the debt, which that kind of sounds in, in the concept of latches to me. Uh, they did not really plead uh, exp uh, expiration of the statute of limitations. On appeal to this court, the Hardesty's tried to raise the statute of limitations, but that statute that they were raising was 1303.16, which relates purely to negotiable instruments. Our case is different in that we are alleging that the statute of limitations on the mortgage itself, not on the underlying debt, although it, the statute had expi has expired on the underlying debt, but rather on the mortgage itself. Um, and that's the chief distinction that, that I see between this case and the Hardesty case. Now, uh, the Ohio Supreme Court has held, granted in older cases, that uh, a mortgage that is no longer enforceable because of the expiration of the statute of limitations is in fact invalid and may be uh, invalidated through a quiet title action. I cite two cases, Hopkins v. Clyde and Eastwood, uh, Eastwood v. Uh, Capital. Um, in both of those cases, the Supreme Court ruled that, in fact, quiet title is available to a property owner to remove an invalidated mortgage because of the expiration of the statute of limitations. And we're asking the court to do the same thing here. That gets us to the issue of exactly what the statute of limitations on a mortgage is, and that's a more complicated question. There's not one. There are really two. Uh, and those two statute of limitations uh, relate to different remedies available on a mortgage contract. And that's because the mortgage contract does two separate things. First, it provides security for payment. Second, it is a conditional conveyance. So when seeking to foreclose uh, on a mortgage, the, a plaintiff is seeking to enforce that security interest. 
that is uh, the Ohio Supreme Court and other courts have held. That is an enforcement of the mortgage as a specialty, which falls under uh, the uh, 2305.06. It's now six years back in 2012, it was amended to you know, eight years and before that it was 15 years. So we've had some development in terms of what the applicable statute of limitations is. But it's always been treated when seeking foreclosure as a specialty subject to the same statute of limitations we see for contracts in general. However, if the plaintiff is trying to enforce the mortgage as a conveyance of real estate, its remedy is ejectment. Now that remedy has a different statute of limitations. It is 21 years. Uh, 21 years from the date the claim accrued, and that statute is found in 2305.04. Um, and that is, in fact, what uh, the plaintiff argued below. I'm sorry, the, the bank argued below. I'm usually on the other side of these cases, so I automatically think of the bank as the plaintiff. Um, and then the bank made an additional argument that the trial court grabbed onto, which is very troubling to me. Instead of determining what the statute of limitations is on a mortgage, the trial court looked at uh, Revised Code Section 5301.30, which says, which is a notice provision. And that section states that uh, for notice purposes to the world, uh, a mortgage is of record and, can, and must be, you know, you got to pay attention to it, uh, for 21 years after the date of maturity. That does not, one, that statute is not a statute of limitations. Two, it doesn't say, that statute does not say that the mortgage is valid and enforceable. The statute merely says that for notice purposes, people have notice of the exist of the potential existence of that mortgage for 21 years after the date of maturity. It's a very different type of statute, and I believe it's completely inapplicable to the case before this court and before the trial court. But that's that's what the trial court grabbed onto. Um, you know, like I said, it's not a statute of limitations. Statute of limitations for uh, the mortgage as a contract uh, is, is as I described earlier. So, uh, this issue of when the statute of limitations expires on a, on a mortgage, um, it, the law in the state's kind of a mess. There have been lots of different rulings that say lots of different things. Some of them have said that a foreclosure action could be brought within 21 years of default. That's not supported by anything. Um, it, it's truly confusing to me. And I asked the court to take a close look at the law that I've cited and at the structure of a mortgage and, and the different remedies available to it. The, the last point, uh, because we, we Ms. Card does concede that uh, the mortgage, in theory, could still be enforceable as a conveyance, meaning that a claim for ejectment still could be asserted. Um, that's possible. That such a claim, though, was a compulsory counterclaim in this action that was not asserted. Um, as I started in my briefing, I kind of walked the court through some of what I've discussed already, and I also raised the issue of, you know, zombie mortgages. I don't do that uh, lightly, but it, I, just want to, I just wanted to bring the court's attention to the fact that this is a problem. Um, and it's a problem it, when, when banks don't enforce their rights to kind of walk away from a property 
and th and that's their that's their prerogative, but it leaves those properties in limbo. Um, people really can't do much with the property. They have to maintain and pay taxes, like uh, Ms. Cart has done, but they really can't do anything with the property. And those, those properties then often sit dormant, and they exacerbate some of the problems we have with urban blight uh, in, in many of our communities. But in this particular case, the property is rented out, correct? Um, honestly, I don't know that it is rented out. But there out, are different Your occupants. Honor. Excuse me? The homeowner that is sued here was not the or that has filed the suit is not is not the occupant. Correct. She she does not live there. She lives elsewhere. Uh, but you know she's been paying the taxes on the property, and uh, her dad's been going over and mowing the lawn. But but I guess my point is you were saying the burden. There's nothing in the record that indicates she was receiving rent from this property. Then that's that's correct. Okay. And I honestly, as I stand here. Don't know. Uh, my understanding that is that not, but I, I don't know why I have that understanding. It could be <laughs> a complete fallacy on my part. Um, this is an issue that, uh, as I said, it, it burdens communities. It keeps real estate from being productive. Um, you know, her option is to stop paying the taxes and let, let it go to foreclosure there. Um, but she doesn't really want to be sued again. She'd rather see the house be put back to productive use. As a practical matter, the bank's never going to file an ejectment, a ejectment action because of what that entails. That forces, because ejectment doesn't get the property so that the bank can then sell the property separately. They can never sell the property through ejectment. All they can do is use the property to generate cash to apply to the debt. But in doing that, they basically undertake fiduciary duties back, in this case, to Ms. Cart, must provide accounting to her, must perform all maintenance, upkeep on it, and pay all the taxes and other expenses related to the property. It, it would turn the bank into a landlord. They don't like that. Um, I mean, this in your years on, on the bench, how many ejectment actions have you seen compared to the number of foreclosures? There's a reason for that. Ejectments are no fun, and if all you can do is apply monthly rents to uh, your, your loan, you're going to be there forever before you collect your money. And Council, I want to alert you. Um, you are at your rebuttal time. That is all I have for now, then, Your Honor. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Fisher with Dinsmore and Scholl. On behalf of Apelli, Bank of America National Association as successor by merger to LaSalle Bank National Association as trustee under the pooling and servicing agreement dated as of May 1, 2006, GSAMP Trust 2006-HE3. Good afternoon, Your Honors. We're here today because the plaintiff, Heather Cart, formerly Ms. Robbins, borrowed $80,000 for the purchase of property here in Marine County in 2005. In order to finance the purchase, she granted a note and mortgage on the property with a 30-year term. The mortgage matures in, on February 1st, 2036, and that maturity date is not yet here. Borrower modified the loan in 2007, and at that time, she agreed she had no counterclaims or rights of set-off. Her last payment on the loan was in late 2008. There was a foreclosure in 2009 that was dismissed without prejudice. As the court noted, the borrower does not occupy the property. Uh, we do not know if it's occupied. It's not in the record. Um, but she has owned the property and had use and enjoyment of it for the last 18 plus years. 
borrower now wants, she filed a suit to wipe out the mortgage on a theory of quiet title. Uh, this is not the law of the state of Ohio, and the trial court granted summary judgment in favor of Bank of America on multiple independent reasons. The judgment of the trial court should be affirmed for each of those reasons. Uh, the first thing that the trial court turned its attention to was Hardesty versus Law Holdings, a ninth district decision authored by Judge Carr, um, that actually did deal with extremely similar facts. In the Hardesty case, the Hardesty's had a purchase money mortgage, like Ms. Ms. Carts, um, and they sought to quiet title against the purchase money mor mortgage before its maturity. The court, the trial court, Judge Rollins in Summit County, dismissed the case sua sponte. And as part of her decision, she noted that, quote, any balance due and owing must be paid by the maturity date of March 1, 2030, which has not yet occurred. There is no requirement the defendant enforce its rights under the note mortgage prior to the maturity date of March 1, 2030, or it forfeits its rights under the mortgage. Judge Rowland also held that the mortgage is not, it was consensual, it's not a cloud, and it's not adverse under the quiet title theory. And she said, she held, the court will not lend its aid to quiet the title without securing to the defendant the money paid in plaintiff's acquisition of that title, which the owners ought to have paid. And she cited to Knoller versus Coy, an Ohio Supreme Court case from 1824. The Ninth District affirmed that decision and held, in fact, that there was no justiciable controversy before the court because the mortgage was not mature, it hadn't been satisfied or paid, and there had been no, uh, there was no grounds to remove the mortgage as a lien against the title. For this reason alone, and the persuasive decision in the Harvesty case, uh, the decision of the trial court should be affirmed. The trial court also held that a quiet title action cannot be used to wipe out a mortgage before its maturity because the mortgage is consensual, because the mortgage is consensual, not adverse, and not a cloud. Uh, following the decision of Deutsche Bank v. Unger, which was an 8th District case from 2012, and in that case, the 8th District held that the, the owners voluntarily signed the mortgage that they had granted the lien against the property and that it wasn't a cloud. The Unger decision has been followed by the 12th district and the 1st district, and those, I have citations, but they're also in our brief. So for that additional reason, the decision of the trial court should be affirmed. The next reason that the trial court relied on is the language of Ohio Revised Code 5301.30. So that was discussed by uh, Mr. Engel, and it is a statute regarding how long a mortgage remains, uh, an unsatisfied mortgage remains a lien on the property. And it provides that the mortgage, if it has a stated maturity date like the one Ms. Cart signed, that the mortgage remains a lien for 21 years after maturity. Um, in, the, in their appellate brief, Ms. Cart did not have an answer about why this statute does not apply to the case here. And Mr. Engel said it again today that he doesn't think the statute is applicable, but that is what the statute is for. It says that the mortgage remains a lien on the property for, unless it's satisfied for 21 years after maturity. The trial court so found that date in this case is 2057, and it has not occurred. Right. An additional reason that the trial court relied on, and which I think I can cut this argument a bit short, because um, Ms. Cart concedes that the statute of limitations for ejectment has, has not expired. So um, there's really no dispute in the case that there is a remaining cause of action that could be raised for ejectment under Revised Code 2305.04. Um, I will note that the Supreme Court held in Deutsche Bank versus Holden that an action at law on a promissory note to collect a mortgage debt is separate and distinct from an action in equity to enforce the mortgage lien on the property. Thus, there's multiple causes of action 
They can be raised at any time, separately and distinctly. Ms. Card today indicated today her counsel indicated that she doesn't believe that the she believes that the statute of limitations on the notice expired. I want to make one point about that. The note is an installment contract with payments due every month. It is not yet mature. It matures in several years. The, the Supreme Court of Ohio talked about installment loans and payments under installment loans in the case of U.S. Bank versus Gulana. It was a double dismissal hold case. And in that case, um, there was a question before the court about when, what constitutes a new default that would create a new cause of action under a promissory note. And the court found that if a borrower reinstated the loan and brought the, brought the loan current or made payments on the loan, that there would be a new cause of action. In other words, a note can have multiple defaults over the course of the 30-year term. There is nothing that would prevent Ms. Cart from reinstating the loan in this case or from making a payment before the expiration of the mortgage term and the, er, the note of mortgage term, which hasn't yet come upon us. So the idea that the statute of limitations has expired, it could that could still change before maturity because Ms. Cart could make a payment. Ms. Um, Cart relies on a couple of cases from the Ohio Supreme Court, Hopkins versus Clyde and Eastwood versus Capel. As noted in our brief, neither of those cases is relevant here today. Um, both of them were filed after both the maturity and expiration of the mortgages at issue. In Clyde, the foreclosure action was brought more than 15 years after maturity. And in Eastwood, it was more than 21 years after maturity. So we would argue that those cases aren't relevant here today because there, our mortgage is not mature, it's not expired, and um, we're still within the statute of limitations. Finally, the trial court properly held that the issue of whether a counterclaim for ejectment would be compulsory is non-justiciable. The court found that it was premature and speculative and that there was no counterclaim before it pending to decide whether, so that it was premature to decide whether or not a counterclaim for ejectment would be justiciable. I'm sorry, would be compulsory. <laughs> My apologies. Um, the finding of non-justiciability is reviewed for an abuse of discretion, and we do not believe there was an abuse of discretion here. As noted, as discussed a few minutes ago, the borrower could still make a payment and restart the statute of limitations, and the mortgage is not yet mature. We'd also like to point out on the counterclaim issue that even if the issue were right, which it is not, or I should say if it were justiciable, which it is not, that there are several reasons a counterclaim for judgment is permissive rather than compulsory. First, the tenants or occupants would be parties to the case and there are no tenants or occupants that are parties to this case here. Second, uh, the issue in a quiet title case is who is entitled to the property, and in an ejectment action, it is who is in possession of the property, and we think those are, those are different. We would direct the court's attention to the case in Wells Fargo versus Lee, which was a sixth district case, and in that case, the sixth district held, uh, the borrower attempted to to rescind a mortgage obligation. And the court held that the earlier action merely determined whether the lease had a valid defense to enforcement of the note and mortgage. The court went on to say, however, the mere fact that the debtor, debtor preemptively sought to assert certain claims that would affect later enforcement of a note does not require that the holder assert a debt collection action at the same time. And finally, as noted in Smith versus Household, Southern District Federal case, the mortgage itself provides that forbearance from pursuing a remedy does not waive the remedy. So the mortgage provides that any forbearance, that if the lender chooses to wait before pursuing a remedy, it's not waiving that right. It's in the mortgage. It's in this mortgage as well. For each of these reasons, independently, the decision of the trial court should be affirmed. No questions. Thank you, counsel. Thank you for your time today. Um, 
I just want to clear up one thing. Uh, Ms. Fisher was talking about the uh, mortgage remaining of record uh, and still being valid for a period of time after maturity. Um, I want to make sure that the court is clear that in 2009, uh, that, that's true, but it can be accelerated before that, the date of maturity. And in 2009, uh, Bank of America's predecessor did institute a foreclosure case. That, for, that foreclosure acts as the acceleration of the note and the mortgage. Uh, so that statute of limitations uh, <coughs> began to run with the filing of the 2009 foreclosure. And as the record establishes, uh, there is there have been no additional payments on the the note since that for, uh, foreclosure case was dismissed a few a few months later in two, 2009. So although you know in certain circumstances the statute doesn't begin to run until maturity, that statute can be accelerated um, or, or begin to run earlier through the process of acceleration, which is exactly what happened here. Filing a foreclosure case is an independent action. Uh, that causes a demand for the entire balance due. So, um, in it, this does case, does it matter that, that that case was dismissed without prejudice? No, because that's it's it's the action of demanding the full payment that triggers acceleration. Um, so basically, from that point forward, um, the bank had well at that time 15 years, and then with the adoption of Senate Bill 224, that was reduced to eight years from the effective date of. of uh, 224 to file uh, a foreclosure claim, and that so that that would have been their eight-year statute of limitations then. Um, so I just want to make sure that the court knew that, that we did have an acceleration. Secondly, Counsel, can I ask you? Did you actually raise that in your summary judgment motion? Excuse me. Did you raise that argument below? Uh, yes, the, that was addressed below with regard to you know the the filing of the prior case. Yes. So that was in your summary judgment motion? Uh, I'll be honest. Okay, we'll look, we'll look. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember right now as I sit here. I apologize, Your Honor. Um, if the court would like a citation, it's uh, Bank of America versus um, Walker, Phenom Walker out of the 8th District that discussed that the filing of the foreclosure action is acceleration of, of the note. Uh, just touching on uh, the Unger decision uh, briefly, um, I was and trying you're going to have to wrap up quickly. Oh, so. okay. I, I do want to say that, that Unger, uh, the issue of Unger was not necessarily the mortgage itself, but whether uh, invalid mortgage assignments could uh, or a, uh, a cloud on the title. Uh, for the reasons I've stated in my briefs and my arguments here today, I'd ask the court to carefully look at some of the history on some of these cases um, and reverse the, the judgment of the trial court. Thank you both for your presentation. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. The clerk of courts will mail a copy of the decision to you on the day that it's released, and the Ohio Supreme Court uh, website will also have it posted. The court is now adjourned.